Are we good? So eccentricity is going to be 14.15. How did we get that? We have the Y bottom. Centroid to the bottom of the double T. We have the clear for the location of the strains from the bottom of the, of the double T. It is going to be three inches. Difference is 14.15, and this is going to be your eccentricity. Now, when you come here with number of strains, you need to have an even number. Because if you put here, let's say three, you put here three. You cannot put here four and here three, correct? You need to have an even number. Otherwise, you're going to be twisting the double T. Any other questions that I, that I should be able to help with? Are we good? Move just, forward. And just yeah. for the load criteria, I was just wondering what exactly you want us to uh, show. It just says uh, double T design for dead load, additional dead load, live load, and factored load. Do you just want those like values? Yeah. So what to... is the load criteria in, in your understanding? If I may ask. Uh, the load that will be applied to the, uh, the structure and then it's able and then its capacity. This is correct, yeah? The applied load, like what? Like we have self-weight, right? Yeah. How much is the self-weight? Um, the self-weight for the double T, I think, shown in the, in the double T. It's right there. Yeah. It says 40 PSF. Mm -hmm. Or if you take 40 times 8, it's going to be what? Is it correct? It's going to be 40 times 8 feet? Okay. Wouldn't it be 40 times the cross-sectional area? So this is a good question. Because it says here PSF, time per square foot of the plan. Does it make sense? Or... How do you guys feel about this? Normal weight, light weight. Is this piece of this cross sectional area, or this is going to be just the weight? It should be the weight for that cross section, right? So then you would multiply it by the span of eight feet. This is not the span. This could be the width of the beam, right? Or the double T. The span is going to be in the other direction. Like, for example, it's going to be 60 feet, right? Yes. <laughs> so this is not the span. This is the width. Now, the question is, which weight can I use here? Where is the weight of this double T in this table? Can I just use this? Yeah, yeah, 418. This gave me the weight. Self weight. We call the self weight. How about the additional dead load? Can you figure out the additional dead load as in P left? How many inches of concrete topping? Do you guys have it in the project statement and the drones? Yes? No? Can you pull it up again? Um, I had seen it before, but it seems like I can't find it anymore on Canvas. I'm going there. Here we go. You see that? Topping slab, three and a half inch minimum concrete topping slab, right? 
and here's the reinforcing. So thickness is not going to be two inches. I'm going to be using here three and a half inch in this specific project. When you go back here and look at the PCI manual or handbook, it just gives it to you for two inch, correct? This is why I'm not using the topping or the top properties. I'm going to be using the on top properties of my analysis. And from here, I'm going to be taking this weight. Now, the double T itself is lightweight. I understand that. You guys see my screen? You see the drawing? Yes. Okay, good. All right. Let me show you back again the manual. Here's the manual, lightweight concrete. I'm going to be using this. It shows here two inch of concrete topping. So this top properties, they are based on this additional two inch concrete on the top of it. Now I'm gonna be having three and a half inch. So I don't need this. Not needed, right? This all what I need. In some cases, this topping that they put here, the concrete two inch concrete will contribute to the strength. In my case here, I'm not gonna be using it in the strength design. I don't need them. So I'm going to be taking out this topping properties and just use on top properties, if this makes sense to you guys. It does. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So load criteria means figure out the self weight, and you have it already in the table. It says here 418. Figure out three and a half inch. It's going to be also light with concrete. I would use maybe 110 ton per cubic foot for the weight. And the number at the end needs to be as in P left, pump linear foot. So what you need to do is to take three and a half inch. If you like to do it, maybe we can do it here quick. Yes, yeah, say 3.5 inches. I'm gonna multiply this by 110 PCF. Multiplied by the thickness is three and a half. I put this already. Then come here, multiply it by. The width, eight feet, and then divide this by 12. Because I have the inch, I need to convert it into feet. The number here is going to be as in P left. Can someone help me with this? Yes. Three and a half divided by 12, put it in feet, times eight feet for the width, times 110 pound per cubic foot. Anyone with a calculator? <laughs> 200, 256.6. 256.6? Yeah. Say 266, 257, P left. So what I would do in my analysis, just add a little bit. This give be what? I'm gonna call this additional dead load, correct? This give be the topping. Do you have any other miscellaneous, like something that you'd like to add here to this concrete topping as an additional dead load? Let's say that you have conduits, you have light what fixtures. What's that? Say it again. The, the rebar, is that part of No, the, the rebar is, is part of this 110. Oh, it is. Okay. But maybe I'd like to add light fixtures, conduits, pipelines, you know? Usually when you go there, inside the parking structure, in many cases, you're gonna see um, like fire sprinkler system, you're gonna see some piping. Um, it goes all the way, I would say here from maybe inch and a half pipe, maybe to six inch pipe, sometimes four inch pipe. And all of this weight needs to be supported by that, right? Light fixtures and so forth. 
So how much weight should I add for all of that as a uniform load? Yes, yeah, say for that, I would add maybe five pizza. This should be plenty. So when I do this here for the additional dead load, I'm going to say miscellaneous, right? Like what? I'm going to say five pizza multiplied by the width, eight feet. I'm going to say this here becomes 40 pump linear foot. This here to be added to the 257. Therefore, additional dead load equals 257 plus 40. And I'm going to say maybe 297, right? Here, left. So I was going to say, yes. In the project statement, you say to use 10 PSF as the additional dead load. So should we use that instead of the five? No, of course, you use the 10. I'm just giving you, I'm not giving... Actually, I don't want to solve the, the project for you. I'm just giving here an example. How would I treat this if I have an actual design that I'm doing here? Okay, thank you. So, uh, yeah, thank you for this question. Thank you very much. So um, I just want to be sure that this example, I'm just throwing here numbers. I want to show you how this can get done. But by no means that I'd like you to solve it for you, to solve the project for you. This is something that you guys will take care of it yourself, you know? Just showing here the process, how it is done. And if you like to take this 279 and say, you say here, say 300 P left, this should be fine. I mean, 2, 3 P, P left here, it's not going to break the, the bank, as they say, right? You should be able to do that. How about life load? What life load should I use? Because now I'm done, right? Now I have dead load, I have additional dead load. What's next? I'm going to say life load. What life load did you use for park construction? Is it given to you? Yeah, 50 PSF. Okay, all right. So I'm going to say 50 PSF. I'm going to say times 8 feet, right? The width. How much is that? 400 p left. This is what you call here the load criteria, but of course you need to be um, you need to be detailed. You say here's dead load, life load, additional dead load, life load, and so forth. Once you come up with all of these values in one sheet, you just need one page for this. You can call this load criteria. If you're going to be using this in your design for the double T, maybe you'd like also to include the load factors. So you can say ultimate load, and then you do 1.4 times dead load. Now, dead load in this case is going to be the self-weight, the 418, plus the 300, or let's say the 297, if you like to add numbers, right? Because it's going to be here 418, you're not reducing really 420. Multiply this by 1.4 versus 1.2 times dead load. This includes additional dead load and self-weight, plus 1.6 life load. So at the end, you can say, uh, design ultimate load is going to be this much as in P left. So your final answer for the load criteria for this double T is going to be all as in P left. Just keep this in mind. Are we good? Questions? Right. Let me switch. Uh, now for um, slide set. Slide set number seven. Do you guys have any questions on it? The equation that we have used at the end, which is a code equation, the one that says FPS. Any questions on it? You're good? Is that the one for slide 17? 
Um, this is in uh, slide set number seven. This is sheet or page 40. Let me show it. Any question on this equation, the use of it? Now, when you have a double T, this means that you're going to have rho because you're going to have some tension reinforcing bars. Maybe I would add two number four in each leg. You know, you have the double T, right? So in each one of them, maybe two number four at the bottom. And then you put the strings right above it. And maybe no compression steel, but if you like to assume some compression steel, it's fine. I'd say maybe also number four at 16 inch in the concrete flange. If you like to use it, if you like to ignore it, it's give you up to you. And you know how to figure out the steer ratio based on these two equations. Very nice and simple equation. You don't really need to do this analysis by figuring out the strain, total strain, and based on the strain, you figure out FPS, and you, then you do iterations. Right. All right, in this lecture, for the slide set, number eight is actually about bridge concrete girders. And as you see here, it says precast pretension. The bridge span is really big. And the girder or the box girder is real heavy. Sometimes it comes in pieces, like segmental, and then they, they put it all together. This also can be one way of doing it. But you don't expect that they're gonna do a formwork at the side and cast the bridge right there because this is gonna be interrupting the traffic. It's gonna be a big hassle. So you can't really do it this way. Most likely you're gonna be cast at some place in the yard and just move it to the bridge. Avoid putting all of this formwork and to block the traffic. I mean, you, you can't really do it in place. What you can really do in place, maybe it's gonna be the concrete topping. So let's try to understand how bridges are made. Like what you see here in this picture, you have girders. You have five spaces, meaning six girders. This can be one of these precast girders. They call this I girder, if you like. PC means precast concrete. So this one here, you will cast it in the earth, in the factory, and they move to the bridge location. Put it in place. Once you put in place, you're going to do this with a crane. Once done, you can put some formwork here. Look at this. And the formwork is not going to be supported by the street or by the floor or by the soil. It's going to be supported by the girders. So now you are not really blocking any traffic. You're not causing problems. And then after that, you start to cast this concrete deck. So the bridge concrete deck is going to be casted and it's going to be being supported by this girders, which is a very good idea. Now the formwork is going to be very simple. I don't need to have any beams, like metal beams steel beams or aluminum beams to support the formwork. It's going to be directly supported by the bridge girders that I'm going to be using in my structure. Once done, I'm going to have some dowels to stick out, and then I'm going to bring this precast barrier, like the guardrail. I'm going to bring this, going to be also precast, just install it there after I'm done, which is a very neat way of doing it, right? Now, you mentioned the dowels? Yeah, dowels sticks out of the concrete slab. Oh. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to show some details and some stuff. Let's give you a comment on it. Because 
how would you confirm here the connection between the girder and between the concrete slab? Can you just let it sit on it? So if you have a strong earthquake and then you have this concrete slab or concrete deck, the bridge deck is going to be right here. It's going to start to shift right and left, right? It's going to be doing this during an earthquake. All sun's going to be out. No support. You can do this, right? How about this barrier or this guard ring? Can you just put it on the top of the concrete deck? The answer is no. You need to have some reinforcing bars running between this to this and between here to there, right? First, how this is going to be done, because this is here pre-tension. It is not post-tension. So you have a strong concrete slab. You see this concrete slab? Do you call it here pre-casting bed? Shown here in black. You have some abutments, like display between each, I'm going to say member and the other. And of course, you're going to be running the strains, and most likely they are going to be just as straight because it's cheaper to make them straight. And then you're going to be blocking it from here. You're going to be anchored here to this abutment. Then start to pull the strain. And then you put the concrete within the formwork. Let's say for this eye girder thing that we were talking about. And then you cast the concrete. Once you cast the concrete, you give it the time. And of course, you're going to have curing. Most likely, it's going to be steam cured. And then after that, you start to cut. The strands right here at this location. And then you just remove the abutment. Once you do this, some camber is going to happen. And the length is going to get shortened a little bit of this concrete member. We understand that. This can be at the time of transfer. This when you transfer the stresses to the beam itself. Now, the type of girders that you should expect to see if you're going to be using these girders, it is going to be one of them is called California I girder. And this is going to be the possible span length. If you like to order it, because you need to pick something standard. Here is the range for the span of this girder. The preferred, you don't really want to push it to 125, but maybe 95. So for each one of these girder types, you're going to have here the possible span length and the preferred. You'd like to stay here. You don't really want to go there. This eye girder is very famous. It has been there for a long time. As it says here, it has been used for the past six years or even more. I'd say maybe 60 to 80 feet, this can be very good. You'd like to go maybe with this one. We have different types of girders. So the very simple one is going to be this eye girder. It doesn't look the best, but it is cheap, available. It has been used for a long time. We have lots of design for it. Look also at the depth to spend ratio, maybe 5%, which is very good. So the depth to span is about 5%. Another one is called here California Bulb T. It's kind of more recent system. At the bottom of it, if you look here, this size is almost the same as the size here. Top and bottom flange are almost the same. Here's the bulb T. You have a bigger section here. And the flange is different. So you can fit here more strands. When you are able here to fit more strands, you see what happened to the span. You can go up to higher spans. So I'm going to be going through some of this, uh, uh, I'm going to say here, sections and just try to understand how it works. So this one here is a bulb T. This one here is a wide flange girder. Look at the flange. And look at the rebars sticking out of it. Vertical rebars. So actually you have something like a tie. If you like call it a tie, it's going to be that thing here. See this? It goes down like this, right? It's like a U-tie.
You have one bar coming down like this. Here's the other bar. And of course, at the bottom, this is like Q bar. So actually, this is attached this way. It's like that. So it works like a shear tile, right? And then once you pick it up from the yard or fabrication place, it's going to be like this. Now you put it in place. After you put it in place, you come here to the top down. This gave you a down sticking up. You're going to be bending it. So it's going to be looking like this. In both sides, of course. Now after this, you put the rebars for the bridge deck, and then you cast the concrete. This is like shear davids because this provides here anchorage between the bridge deck and between the bridge girder. In many cases, also, you can have this composite action between the top girder, excuse me, between the top concrete deck and between the bridge girder itself. So you can gain a little bit of a strength if you want to. This is here also the white flange girder, same thing. You have all the dows sticking up. This is going to get bent later on. Now, here's some reed sections with some properties and some information. Here is the standard eye girder. And you notice maybe the top flange is very close from the bottom flange. Three, six, and this gives you six and six inches. And for each one of them, you have a call out for it, like a type or a mark, like California I-36. is gives you three feet, 36 inch deep, 42, 48, and so forth. And for each one, you have all the properties. My bottom, my top, and here's the weight. So actually, if you are doing a bridge design, you have the sections. It's like a state section. You have all the properties for it. And then also you have how many strands would you add? This could be strands, the six middle ones, and the six, three to the right, three to the left. Most likely it's going to be bonded rebars, conventional rebars. So this is good. You have all the information you need if you are doing a bridge design. You just pick one of these, right? And you just finish your design. Here's a California bulb T girder. You see the width here is only 19 inch. So the concrete deck is going to be, let's say, spanning. If the spacing is going to be six feet, this going to be six feet. And then you have the support of half of the 19 inches. Let's say about nine and a half inches, right? right and left, but look here, about four feet, 47 and a quarter. You have lots of strands here, all of the circles gave you strands. And then you have this big circle, look at this. This big circle says here, optional post-tension ducts. This means all of this is gonna be pre-tension, strands that you put in there, while you're fabricating it. And then after that, if you like, you can do more tensioning. So just think about it this way. The amount of strands that you put here in the pre-tension should be enough to move this girder from station A to station B, from the fabrication yard to the bridge location. After that, if you need more pre-stressing, you can apply it, but it's gonna be post-tension, and then you do this at the side. So actually, this combination between pre-tension and between post-tension, just in one beam. And you need it. In this type of bridges, you need it. Because this can be supporting lots of traffic, lots of loads. So maybe you don't want to do all the pre-stressing at the fabrication yard. And then maybe later on, you add a little bit of pre-stressing. Now, this can be here inside some ducts. You know the ducts? It looks like the conduits like electrical ducts or conduits. And this one here is gonna have a profile, meaning at the beginning of, and the, at the end of this girder is gonna be maybe close to the CG. In the middle of the span, you know exactly the exact location that you're gonna see. Most likely the pretension strands is gonna be straight, just to make it easy. 
is all about the cost and just ease of construction. Any questions? Yeah? We're good? All right. Here's another one section that they call it California bathtub. Looks like a bathtub, right? And this one here is going to have a concrete slab on the top, which is the bridge deck is going to be like this. And of course, it's going to have lots of dowels sticking out this way, right? Some dowels going to be coming up. You're going to bend it. So it's going to look like this for the reverse. Good thing about it within this, I mean, from outside, it looks nice. Much nicer than just the bridge deck with this uh, double, uh, excuse me, with this uh, eye girder thing. Now think about this shape or this um, bridge versus a bridge like this. Looks clean from outside. If you have plenty of pipelines and you can just run inside and electrical conduits just running within this um, box girder. Same thing, you have lots of straight this is going to be straight pretension strains and then you're going to have post tension also sometimes this comes as segments so you have pieces you put them together and once you put them together now we need to run the strains it's going to be post tension so just imagine if you have a piece like this with a span let's say of 30 feet just only 30 feet so it's going to be a piece maybe 30 to 40 feet long so it's going to be a 30 foot long or maybe 50 foot long piece. Most likely it's going to be small pieces. If you are going to be doing segmental construction, it's going to be small pieces. And then you put them one, one next to each other. And then you run the strands through them. And then you start the pre-stressing. So there's going to be pieces next to each other. I'm not sure if you guys have seen this or not. It's going to be pieces like this. And then after that, you put the post tensioning system, right? And of course, it's going to be draped, and you just apply the post tension, right? Another one, which is this white flange. This is about four feet, and look at the bottom here. Lots of strands. And look at the span that this can go to. Just want to keep this in mind. You see the depth? It can go up to 10 feet for the depth. Just imagine here, 10 foot deep girder versus if I may go back here, maximum is maybe five feet, five and a half. And look at the span here for the wide flange, 180 feet. It can go to 180 feet, 200 feet. Biggest span, really large span. We have also some of this, uh, the, the slab, like the holocore slab, sometimes they call it holocore or voided slab to make it light they put here some uh, ducts like seven inch as you see here and they put the concrete sometimes gonna be nine inch 12 inch just to make it lighter to reduce the weight and this can be used here for small bridges they don't really use it for like big spans it's gonna be for very small spans as you see here maybe total of 18 inch or so as you see here here's a double t and if you like to have here some concrete topping, you see the dowels is going to be sticking up so that it bonds with the concrete um, deck. Same thing here for the box girder. Same thing here for this box girder, right? And then you need to have some rebars to tie into the concrete deck. Now, the loading design and stages in bridges is going to be a little bit different from that of buildings so the first stage here this is going to be when you cast the bridge girder and then you start transferring the stresses 
I have here a few stresses. You add them all up to this stress distribution. This is going to be one check. So this is going to be at the time of transfer. Or add an instantaneous pre-stressing. The type of forces and loads acting on this girder is going to be number one, the self-weight. So you take this M, right? Due to the gravity weight, the self-weight, divided by S, you get this distribution. You add to it the effect of the pre-stressing, which comes from the direct compression plus P times E, the moment coming from the pre-stressing effect. Just add all the top stresses to each other, bottom stresses, and be sure that compressive stresses here is going to be within 0.6 of a prime C. So great. And for the tension, also you have certain limits. It depends. Do you want it to be designed as cracked or uncracked? It's going to be up to you. It's going to be the first stage. Now, this strand here sometimes is going to be straight and sometimes going to be draped. Draping is kind of tough and it's going to be uh, more uh, expensive. Just imagine here if I go back to this picture, just have the strands are straight. So it's much simpler. All what you need to do is to design this abutment to be able to take, to take this jacking force. Now, if you like to drape it, I'm going to show you in a few minutes the mechanism to use it. So first, I'd like to finish this type of stages or phases when it comes to the applied stresses and forces to understand how this can be different here from buildings. So again, first, this can be at the time of transfer. You check the stresses top and bottom. Now, the second phase here, when you add the concrete slab. When you add the concrete slab, this concrete slab is not hardened yet. If it is not hardened, it means effective section is going to be the bridge girder itself. So what you need to do to take the stresses from the previous stage, stage one, you have the stress values. You just draw it here again. And now you start to add the weight of the slab to it. How do you add this? You take this, the weight of the slab, and then divide by the section modulus of the girder itself. This slab is not contributing to the strength. You say, okay, due to the self weight of the slab, which is kind of additional dead load, you're going to have here some tension, some compression. You add it to the previous stress distribution. Then you have maybe more compression on both sides. And also, you, you need to do here to check the stresses again. So again, the first phase, fabrication. Second phase, it is going to be adding the concrete deck on the top of the beam. Now, after you add the concrete topping or concrete slab, now the concrete slab is going to get hardened. But this stress distribution is locked within the girder itself. Now, this concrete slab is going to contribute to the strength of this girder. Because now it is hardened. You can go back and look at this distribution. Say, now I'm going to change this distribution because now I added concrete deck. You can do this because the beam is already sagging or it is stressed under this given loads. So all of the stress is already within the beam. Once you add the concrete slab or concrete deck, you're going to be adding more stresses to it, which is this distribution. And these stresses are now locked within the beam. Now, the strength of this beam and the moment of inertia is going to be different because you added this concrete slab and now it is hardened. So here's the stress from phase 2A. Now the slab is hardened. Now your section is different. You used to have a section with no concrete topping or with no concrete deck on the top. Now you have a section 
whose higher section modulus was this thing, right? And section modulus, like S top and bottom, is different now. If you are using the same concrete here, the multiple assist is going to be the same. If you choose concrete deck to be higher strength or to be smaller strength, like lower strength than the beam, you need also to consider this in the multiple assist of the concrete. But the section model itself is going to increase. At the beginning, when we were talking here about the stresses, the highest stress in compression, let's say, was happening right at the top of the girder. This concrete deck is not taking any stresses. Now, after it's hardened, look what happened. Now, this piece here, this concrete deck, started to see some stresses. Moment of inertia has increased. Section modulus, top and bottom has increased. Now, any new loads that you're going to be adding to this system, to the structure member, when you check the stresses, now you need to check it based on the composite, which means on the new section modulus, not the old one. The old one, we did not consider this. Now, the new one, we need to consider this. Look what happened. This is stress distribution. is going to be at the end of stage or phase 2A. Now, any new stresses coming to it is going to be based on the new section properties. And this includes what? It includes all new weights that you're going to be adding after the fact. Look at this distribution here. After you added the concrete slab, that was a stress distribution. Now for the additional dead load, not included in the concrete deck, is going to be including the barrier, any additional dead load that you add to it, such as piping, conduits, anything that you add there. When you do the stress distribution for it, you need to consider this, this piece here. Now the stress is gonna be complete different distribution. Is it okay? This is completely different from what we do in buildings. In buildings, we don't really care about the concrete topping because concrete topping is going to be maybe three and a half inch, maybe two inches. And the depth of the double T or the girder is going to be maybe 24 inch, 30 inches. But in here, you're talking about the concrete slab, which is a bridge deck, is going to be maybe eight inch, sometimes 12 inch. So it has some values. So why not use it in the strength? if this is going to be reducing the stresses at the end for you when you do the check. So, okay. Now, you're going to have also traffic. Now you have life load. When you have life load, what properties would you use? Of course, you're going to be using the one with the concrete deck. Now the concrete deck, which means a higher section model, is going to be used. And look at the stress distribution now. Here's when you have the life load. So this gave you the previous. Now here's the life load. This gave you the final stresses. So as you see here, you're gonna have more details in your analysis. You're gonna have more stages or more phases in your check for the stresses while we didn't do this in building design. Now a question to you, what is happening here? Why do we have a drop? You see this drop in the stresses? What's going on? Can someone help me with this? Section change. Section becoming stronger, right? Right. Yeah, makes sense. All right. Now, how about the draping? This is a question that I've been asked, and you guys, you can see it in the chat box room draping is expensive you're going to have some mechanical devices to keep the strand within this profile that you'd like to get to if any movement is going to happen to this mechanism you're going to be losing the profile you're going to be in trouble so the easiest way just keep it straight so usually pre-tension you'd like to keep it straight in post-tension, you're going to have ducts. 
for the strands, you run the ducts in the profile you want it. And then later on, you put the ducts in, or maybe you have the ducts from the beginning, but you don't really apply any tension to it. So the conduit or the ducts is going to stay in place easily. The good thing when you have this draping, you're going to be using the concrete efficiently. Because when you look at the middle section, you really need to have the strands at the bottom. When it comes to the end section of the girder, you'd like to have it close to the centroid. And with that, you're going to be reducing the amount of eccentricity coming from the pre-stressing. So as it says here, you have some advantages, disadvantages, the safety, what happened, you know, I mean, the cost and this type of things. So look here at this profile. Here is the profile that we'd like to keep at. Now, this one here, we're going to put some tension, right? We're going to have tension here in this, right? And this is going to be anchored. Or maybe it's going to be going to the next beam, which means that you're going to have another tension force. Now, any mechanism that you put here, this cable or this trans wants to lift up. It wants to go up like this. It wants to be straight because once you start to apply tension here, it wants to do like this. And what's stopping it? It's going to be this mechanism. So this mechanism needs to bring it down. So what happened? First, they run this straight and they run the cable. And then they start to jack it down. Right? They jack this down just to control it in place. Once you start to apply tension here, as if you want to bring this up, now, this jacking needs to be anchored at the bottom, at the foundation. And, of course, this needs to be designed. So here's some additional cost. Here's a picture of it. If you like to see the picture, it's give you the system, the mechanism, the jacking, it goes down, and this give you the cast bed. And you see here, this give you the dowels that goes down and then goes up because these dowels are going to hook it up to the concrete uh, deck. Any questions? No, thank you. We're good. All right. Now, the strands that you run here, you can have it inside a duct, but you can just have it bonded to the concrete. It's going to be up to you. If you have it bonded, it means that the transfer is going to be going through the first few feet of the girder. If you have it running through a duct, it means that the force that you're going to be putting the beam is going to be only at the end. So you have two different design methodologies, right? If you have trouble with the anchorage later on, and you don't have any bonding between the strand and between the concrete, it means that you lose the entire pre-stressing. So the anchor needs to be well-maintained, right? While if you leave it within the concrete, and just kind of cast the concrete on it, transfer is going to be happening within the first few feet. It's going to be kind of safer. You don't really have to worry about the anchorage because actually there is no anchorage. The force transfer is happening right here. And the whole thing here is bonded. Just different way of thinking, right? So here's the bonding. If you are going to be running it without this sheeting or without the duct, it's going to be no bonding. So this is a mechanism of debonding it that you just wrap it in sheets or maybe put it in ducts. So if you look here at this picture, you see here some strands, this here bonded, and some strands going to be debonded, right? And here's the way to do it. In bridges, the precast concrete pipes as we have discussed here, we have some stuff that we call here pretension. And then we have the length and the span based on the first table, the schedule that we have looked at at the type. And then we have some splice girders, like this segmental construction, right? Like in this one here. And sometimes we have just Girders that you can just attach to each other, which is the same idea. So actually, this can be very similar to that. And each system of them, it goes to a certain span, final span of the bridge. 
the segmental, like usually with box girders, would go up to 400 feet. And I guess now we understand the reason that we have it to be segmental. Because you can't really cast a system that's going to be 400 foot long and just transport it. You can't do this. It's going to be big trouble. But maybe if you can have it like 50 feet, 30 feet, you can ship the segmental pieces and just assemble it there. Any questions? All right. Some construction pictures. Here's the girder. Some dowels sticking out of it. And you see this piece here? Since you're going to be putting here high concentrated point load, we call this going to be the end block. So let me type the name of it here. End block. This end block right there, you're going to be transferring lots of stresses right here. Right? This why they make this solid. Because this is going to be a thin web. You don't want to put this high compressive stresses and force right on the thin web. So they make this solid. Usually, this the length of this end block is similar to the depth. So this length from here to there is almost the same as the length of the end block. And this end block, it has a design by itself. There's methods to design it. If you have post tension, it means all the forces transferred here. So you're gonna have different design, right? But if you have pre-tension and the force itself is gonna get transferred from the strains to the concrete within the block, you're gonna have less of a problem. Just imagine if you have here a system with this concentrated load. This concentrated load it wants to create some cracks in this direction. And to bring this back together, you need to add ties. So most likely it's going to be closed ties. And here, around the section. So the end block design is going to be giving some solid length to it. It's going to be number one. Number two, putting some ties. And the ties is going to be very important in this case. When you have more than one span, you need to have bent. A bent is going to be supporting the bridge itself. So we can have type of caps, if you like, or we call it bent. The bridge bent is going to be different. We have different types. Here's a drop cap. So this is going to be a column bent. This is going to be like a wall. And this is going to have a, like a seat. And then you have the bridge girder come from one side and almost touching the bridge from the other side, and then the bridge girder from the other side, and then you just cast here the concrete deck. Here's the detail for it. Here's the girder, the other girder, is gonna be dropped cap. And this gonna be like uh, the supports, it could be piles or whatever. And of course, you'd like to leave here a gap, little gap, this gonna be for the expansion because concrete expands, right? And we're talking here about long spans, so you don't want them to crush or push against each other. So you'd like to give it a little bit of a gap. In some cases, the cab is gonna be going up, is gonna be also bonded to the concrete slab or the concrete deck. So in a case like this, the cab itself is gonna have a kind of a stem wall that sticks up and then you pour this in concrete. You pour this all together. It's going to be a different type of construction. It depends on the design. And again, the bridge girder is going to stop here. And look at this. This is what they call here the end block. This piece here. It's going to be like thick and solid. After this, you're going to have the eye girder. After this. Sometimes you have this inverted T-cap. It's kind of similar to this, but it's really large. Look how the bridge is sitting. 
the bridge girder is going to be simple. It's going to be one of the standard pieces that you put above this ledge. And then you have this bearing here, bearing pad. While in here, if you look at the girder itself, you see that you have a notch in the girder. Different design. And look at this distance. It's going to be a big one. Right? The width of it is going to be real big. So anyways, with that, now we have some idea about bridge design. When it comes to girders, precast girders, post tension, relationship between the concrete slab and between the bridge girder itself. In the block, and why do we need it? What's the importance of having an in the block? And the stages, which was very critical thing. What's going to happen here in the stage of stressors? This means in our project and in everything we usually do, we ignore this thing, the concrete deck or the concrete slab effect in the strength and stresses. So I want you guys to know that there is a way to include this by just looking at the top properties. If you remember in the bridge, uh, excuse me, in the project uh, submitted, we said, just disregard the topping, which means top properties not going to be used. Just use a bear. Now, in here, I'm saying there could be also, I mean, someone here can consider the concrete deck and just add it to the strength and the section modulus of the bridge girder. And uh, do we have any questions before I let you go? I just had a question about the cap. Um... Uh, there are dowels coming out as well. Yeah. Look at this. Look at the rebars. You see the down? It's going all the way up, tied into here. Got it. Thanks. Yeah. All right. You guys, uh, you enjoyed the break. Thank you, professor. Right. Thank you, professor. Thank you, professor. Have a good night. Thank you, professor. Oh, Thank you. Thank good you. night. Bye. All right. Good night. Good night. Have a good break. Thank you. You too. Bye. Uh, uh, professor, I have a question about the project. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So give me uh, a second, uh, please. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah.